She served as chair of the Department of Comparative Literature for 12 years, as master of Stevenson Hall, and co-founded the program in translation and intercultural communication. She recently completed a term as president of the American uh, Comparative Literature Association and is the author of the sonnet over time, studies in the sonnets of Petra, Shakespeare, and Baudelaire, translator of Manzoni's on the historical novel and editor with Michael Wood of Nation, Language, and the Ethics of Translation. For our fir first respondent in the afternoon, Sandra. Thank you. So I understand I have uh, 45 minutes. And I think since really there are four uh, essays to talk about, the two written ones <laughs> that I read and the, and the recent uh, oral presentations, um, there's, a, there's a lot to say. But I'll try to stay within my time frame and let me know if I get anywhere near uh, the end of it. I'm going to try to respond to both papers, uh, and so is Edwin. So we'll just have different views, and we did not discuss in advance exactly what those views are, so um, you, we will discover how they overlap or don't. Um, in both of these papers, I should say, really, uh, really strike me as very rich in themselves, and also as wonderful contributions to thoughts about a literary education, as I mentioned to, to both of you. Though I'll try to outline and raise questions about the main points as I see them in these articles, uh, time will only allow for a very partial look. And in general, it seems to me that Gayatri Spivak's paper lends insight into the very process of gendering and translation um, in this uh, deep sense as these relate to the creation of the translator and culture more generally. Whereas Anthony Pym's deals more with transmission and exchange, its ways of transforming others as it transforms itself, and both kind of essential when you think of comparative literature or literary study. So let me begin then with uh, Gayatri's paper. And uh, really what I'm going to do at the beginning is give my translation or my reading of certain moments in it. And Gayatri can then correct me later on. But this uh, contribution focuses on gender and translation in the global utopia and argues among other things, I think, for a more reflective and indeed more intimate look at a series of interlocking terms and concepts, globalization, utopia, gender, language, translation, equivalence, to name the ones that struck me particularly. In each case, the essay leads toward a more particularized and more intimate description. And in the process of this description, each term is transformed in meaning. I'll focus here particularly on the terms gender and translation, but all of them are interrelated, so come up. As Gayatri mentioned uh, earlier, the article begins by talking about uh, the, the fact that utopia might be considered a no place, um, a good place that we try to approximate, not achieve. Um, and globalization, which depends upon the economy of equivalence, the same system of exchange all over the globe, holds out the false promise of utopia as equivalence in terms of capital, this um, economic level playing field. In globalization, gender itself is often used as a way to translate experience embedded in a deep cultural experience into this general equivalence. And as she teaches, gender allows us to abstract, since the process of gendering, this movement of gendering, is for her, as I understand it, the creation of culture itself. But its apparent immediacy to sexuality is sometimes thought to be concrete as such, and hence the frequent involvement of the gender work of the international civil society. In fact, as um, Gayatri explains it, and always this, when I'm saying this, this is my reading, obviously, but as she explains it, gender is a position without identity. It includes, for instance, queers as well as women. And though globalization in the form of NGOs may think of gender in concrete terms, she tells us that it is possible, quotation, that gendering in the concrete is in fact inaccessible to agential probing or use 
by the NGOs. She explains why this is so in a central section. And here she describes of the paper as I read it. She describes how the self is formed and then how language is acquired. And these are essential to my mind, to her idea of the human subject and culture, as well as to what we call translation. According to this view, drawn in part from her reading of Melanie Klein, the self begins in translation. And Gayatri was talking about that in answer to some very pertinent questions. Indeed, as she puts it elsewhere, the work of translation is, quote, an incessant shuttle that is a life. Grabbing an outside indistinguishable from an inside, I continue with Gayatri's words, constitutes an inside going back and forth encoding everything into a sign system by the things grasped. <laughs> this crude coding taking place in infancy between world and self as part of the formation of a self is a translation. End of quote. And this is using the word here in a very broad, or as she sometimes says, catacritic sense. It's a catacresis. It's the large sense of translation. This translation creates a life. And more specifically, in this weaving of a human self in which sexual difference helps the infant constitute a world, violence, she says, translates into conscience and vice versa. For all of us, nature passes and repasses into culture in this work of, or shuttling site of violence in what Gayatri calls the violent production of the precarious subject of reparation and responsibility. The infant can never give back all that is taken. In this sense, gendering is a translation that creates both self and culture. Moving a bit further in the infant's chronology, Spivak turns to the question of language acquisition itself. There is a language we learn first, she says, mixed with the pre-phenomenal, which stamps the metapsychological circuit, circuits of lingual memory. The child's language is inserted into the named language with the history before the child's birth, which will continue after its death. As a child begins navigating language, it eventually accesses the interior network of that language, its memory. And in her view, translation studies must imagine that each language may be activated in this particular way when we translate or think through the moves of languaging. Now, End of quote. At this point in Spivak's argument, she's introduced, I think, some important, though controversial, ideas. She's made it possible to think of translation in a way not usually contemplated in translation studies, unless you read Gayatri Spivak, of course. And I think it is important. It's a mode of thinking about language acquisition and translation not unfamiliar in some anthropological views. And there is um, an the work of Becker, for instance, referenced by Spivak, where cultural presuppositions are also seen to emerge from the processes of language learning. But this view also has very strong ethical aspects to it. It helps us better understand and uphold an awareness of uh, what she calls the metapsychological equivalence among languages. The nearest counterpart to thinking the metapsychological equivalence of languages, since we all go through this same process of languaging, this is something we all would share. One of the nearest counterparts to this view may well be found in the writings of Edouard Glisson, who proposes an understanding of creolization and multilingualism that also takes account of the equivalence of all the globe's languages. And I'll come back to this shortly. But I wanted to continue with my attempt to, uh, to, to sort of outline some of Spivak's points here. Her account of originating, originary translating allows us to perceive then the human equivalence of all languages in the sense that we construct our individual selves in language. All of us do that if you take this perspective. And this process, then, we share. We don't share the same languages. No, not at all. But we might share in this process of languaging that I've, that I've tried to describe. Um, and this awareness of the process of languaging is a way toward a sort of equivalence among languages that is a blurring as suggested, a blurring of identity, as suggested by Balibar, a way to work against 
any attempt of civil war or hatred more generally, um, I would say extremisms tend to be against blurring, extremisms of all kinds, and the waviness of identities of all kinds. Extremisms prefer sharply cut identities. And waviness, by the way, is a term I draw from a recent 9-11 memorial remark, a set of remarks by Anthony Appiah. Um, this, this sense that you don't want the blurring. But thinking the process of languaging and of gendering helps us to be aware of the complexity of our individual growth and what we share in this with everyone. Moreover, if translation studies bears in mind what Spivet calls this originary translating, these, all these processes of uh, self-creation and cultural creation, um, then translation in the more restricted sense that we use more ordinarily can also be that which continues to teach us, construct us, leaving the self open and changing as a condition of its very life. For it, too, is based on language learning. And I come back to this question of language learning that Gayatri has brought up uh, in discussion a language learning process that can be a simulacrum of this original <laughs> effort of creating the self out of learning language, gendering, and then this languaging that is uh, originary to our sense of ordinary language. And this will also produce an ethical response to the original. Um, we will always be there thinking through this other, the language of the other. So of the other language, in this case, if you're translating from French or translating from Italian, what I'm used to uh, thinking about, we will always be thinking through that language and responding to it, in part because of this originary languaging. As Vivek turns from the originary language translating that creates the human self to translating in the more restricted sense, she evokes two theories of literary translation. You add yourself to the original, or you efface yourself and let the text shine. And though she subscribes to the second, to the latter, the actual process of translation is not therefore simple. It invokes what she calls the most, quote, intimate act of reading. And again, in her words, it involves a sort of, quote, love. And like love, never simple, to be sure. She invokes the analogies of the embrace, its violence, the prayer to be haunted by ghosts of an ultimately inaccessible and inevitably bodiless other that is the original. We can never have the original, um, only our simulacrum of it. And in this kind of translating, the translator must be a, quote, ventriloquist, performing the contradiction, the counter resistance at the heart of love a love that has gone through the process of learning that second language and reading through it in this intimate act. And this sort of translating with its keenly felt double bind, love the original, share the original, culture cannot, must be exchanged, can only be thought as an activism, um, according to Gautry, not a convenience. And in this context, she turns to Benjamin's famous essay, The Task of the Translator, to offer a new solution to the old discussion of the pure speech, we all know this, uh, this meaning, meaningless speech which makes translation possible. In viewing this, quote, meaningless speech as central to informatics rather than to the sacred, she speaks of it as the process of signification which allows for there to be meaning within established conventions. Quote to quote, um, this originary condition of possibility is what makes translation possible, that there can be meaning and not necessarily tied to singular systems. It's also what makes the history of the subject possible in this view as she uh, makes reference to Lacan and the unconscious. So my, one of my first questions, or my first question for uh, Gayatri, and I just have my questions uh, embedded in this talk, is. Uh, really to hear more about this originary condition of possibility and how it relates to what begins as gendering and languaging that she speaks of before. I think this is a really exciting uh, insight into Benjamin, by the way. Uh, so I would like to hear more about that, if possible, just for uh, to understand this much better. 
In any case, uh, Spivak uh, admits that these are, quote, mysterious thickets of individual and linguistic life in which the possibility of ordinary translation emerges, but only if institutionally we can teach foreign languages so that when a student is producing in it, and Gautry has spoken of this, she has forgotten the language which was rooted in the soul, this quotation. Roots which, so sur Lacan, information theory, and in its own way, Benjamin, uh, see as themselves produced as rhizomes without specific ground, end of quote. Here, Gayatri touches upon a notion of language and translation as rhizomic or rhizomatic that I've talked about myself, but this talked about in a very different way here. In the idea of language or translation as related to a kind of rhizomatic, not completely rooted, sense or not rooted uh, sense of language has been developed to some degree by Francois Oust, um, Edouard Glissant, and Stefano Arduini, I think, has talked about this as well, just reading your comments about that. Um, dependent upon notions of changeful encounter, it views language not as an arboreal structure rooted in specific meanings that require successful modes of translation as pure equivalents, but rather one that itself changes, transforms, recreates precisely through an encounter with this language that is another. In these reciprocal encounters of the rhizome, something new in language and self develops something that did not exist before. The language that we have from a translation didn't exist before within the culture. <coughs> to return to Gayatri's essay here, um, after her account of Benjamin, what is important, she tells us, is that rather than theorize globalization as a general field of translation, which with its um, empirical work of apparently impersonal mechanical translation in fact privileges host or target ceaseless, ceaselessly and indefinitely, we should learn to think that the human subject in globalization is, quote, an island of languaging, which is why I tried to go through that at the beginning, that, that we are in this process of languaging, and that each of us must think that process somehow and evenly understanding some languages and idioms from the first language, which becomes our kind of monitor. Uh, we think that. This again has, I think, a strong ethical implication. If, quote, the global translating in the achievable utopia of globalization, I quote her, and gender work ceaselessly transforms trace to sign, sign to data, undoing the placelessness of utopias, this arrogance is checked and situated if we learn with humility to celebrate the, quote, possibility of meaning, that goes back to the Benjamin discussion, in a grounding medium that is meaningless. If we can think this, um, we have some of our arrogance uh, checked and our awareness of otherness in place. Conceiving this possibility of meaning as our grounding medium could perhaps enable an education that remains reflectively open to the equivalence of all languages, as well as to encounter and change. And again, this is a way of seeing human and textual entities as themselves open and rhizomatic. And that recalls for me, Edward Glissant again, for whom the individual uh, culture, like the individual self, is the result of what he calls creolization, and something that works against the fixed and strongly rooted within a culture or language. Creolization uh, that Gautry has mentioned and talks about in one of her most recent articles captures for Glissant the complexity and changefulness that's within each language. And it also conjures a, planet, a planetary multilingualism and an awareness of this. For everyone, uh, for him, one should always write with all the languages in the world in mind, which makes me think a little bit about this whole question of language gendering, just being somehow aware of this. Above all, creolization reveals the ongoing human potential to encounter something other, and from that encounter to create more open, creolized, linguistic, cultural, and individual human identities. And though Spivak does not say exactly what I just took from Glissant at all, she does evoke uh, Glissant's importance in this line, to this line of thinking. So I mention this as just a useful way to perhaps think about identities of selves and texts 
as well as to think about translation. For Glissant himself speaks of rhizomatic or relational identities. You can see I'm going to use this as a bridge to get to Professor uh, Pym's discussion. But Glissant speaks of rhizomatic or relational identities. In describing a utopia of his own, one, cannot, uh, one not altogether unrelated to the one described here by Gayatri, I think, although I'll wait for her to tell me. Uh, Glissant speaks uh, specifically to his reader's imagination, not to facts. He says, uh, not the global every day. He puts it very clearly, quote, can we not imagine a new dimension of identity, open to the truth or simply the presence of the other? An identity that would not be the projection of a unique and sectarian root, but of what we call a rhizome, a root with a multiplicity of extensions in all directions, not killing what is around it as a unique root would, but establishing communication and relation. It seems that man's mind, and especially his imagination, must assume this challenge. And I think it is all the future anterior. I mean, he doesn't think this is going to happen. It's something to bear in mind. And if one says that's a utopian idea, I continue the quotation here, it should be remembered that no change in human history has occurred without utopian ideals. Um, though Lisson's description of relational interactions carry with them a keen and frequently stated awareness of the ultimate untranslatability of each particular culture, language, and person, he nonetheless prizes identities that create themselves through dialogue and transformative exchange to produce what he thinks of as an unpredictable future of thought and self. And the connection he sees between such identities and translation, or these changing identities and translation, is very direct. He writes in um, Introduction to uh, the, the Poetics of the Diverse, quote, the language of the translator operates like creolization and like relation in the world. In relation, of course, he doesn't mean harmony, not at all. He's very explicit about that, but rather encounter. So the language of the translator operates like creolization and like relation in the world. That is, its language produces the unforeseeable. Translation is a veritable operation of creolization. From now on, a new practice of that unstoppable cultural metissage. It's a way the end of quote. This utopia to be imagined through a translation that does not enter into the calculus of globalization seems to me to enter into intriguing dialogue with Gayatri's uh, essay. So my second question to her would be whether and how far she sees Glissant's views of interest to her own. <laughs> 